Hello everyone and welcome to, to Fusion EP Talks, student-led webinar on fusion science and technology. My <coughs> name is Daniel Medina and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce Professor Emeritus Guido Van Ost from Ghent University. He is one of the founders of the European Master of Science in Nuclear Fusion and Engineering Physics and of the International Doctoral College in Fusion Science and Engineering. Uh, he was a part-time professor at the National Research Nuclear University in Moscow, Russia, and the National Research University, Moscow Power Eng Engineering Institute. He is also an honorary professor of Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. Since 1972, Professor Vanos has been involved in the development of control fusion by magnetic confinement in the framework of the, Eurofusion, uh, of the Eu European Fusion Program which means that he has almost 50 years of experience in this, in, in this field. Congratulations, Guido, for your career, and I will really encourage uh, the students present here to take this great opportunity and ask a lot of questions to learn a lot from such an experienced scientist. Today, Guido will talk about the new EIA book, Fundamentals of Magnetic Fusion Technology. The main objective of, of this textbook is to contribute to the consolidation and better exploitation of the achievements already reached and to tackle the present challenges in preparing the workforce in the different areas, with special attention to continuous professional development and lifelong learning. This textbook is edited on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of Fusion Research. The book covers a wide range of topics and will also be useful for specialists from academia, research institutions and companies who want to acquire knowledge of other areas in magnetic fusion technology, as well as for a wider range of readers interested in the establishment of magnetic fusion as an energy source. Without further delay, I will now mute myself and hand over to Guido. Welcome everyone and enjoy the talk. Okay, thank you Daniel for your uh, nice introduction. So uh, good afternoon to everybody in Europe and good morning or good evening to people from other parts of the world. So as you can see from the title, uh, this is uh, for Fusion EP a rather unusual talk. It is not about a specific scientific topic. Uh, it is about uh, the establishment of a, of a textbook. Okay, since uh, it is uh, meant for uh, education, it's really a textbook for education. Uh, I will very briefly uh, describe the fusion landscape in the first place from uh, EU point of view, then uh, describe a bit what is the landscape in the field of fusion education, then briefly go through the different uh, 12 chapters. And as an example of one of these chapters, I will deal a little bit more with uh, critical issues for materials. So it is just a choice. It doesn't mean that this chapter is more important than others. And then draw some uh, conclusions. So fusion um, as a future uh, sustainable energy source. So a reliable and sustainable sources of energy will uh, be a very important ingredient for human development. Since carbon-based energies have an enormous impact on our climate, and everybody hears about this uh, every day now, especially since the COP26 in Glasgow, uh, alternative energy sources must be developed. The solution for the energy and climate problems can only come in the, for, in the form of a portfolio of options that includes improvements in energy efficiency and renewable energy, nuclear fission, carbon capture and storage, and nuclear fusion. And uh, as you may know in this context, in, in a few days, the European Union will decide about the so-called uh, taxonomy of energy sources if um, nuclear fission can be considered as green, at least in a transition phase, and uh, even if gas will be considered as green. Okay, I will not <laughs> discuss this and not give my point of view, uh, but okay, in my opinion, we need all the options and the number of possible options 
sustainable options is quite limited. So controlled uh, thermonuclear fusion is one of the very few options to provide us with a long-term environmentally friendly and inherent safe contribution to solve the energy problem. It has advantages uh, that become more and more important. So nowadays, not nowadays, but since uh, two decades or more, the aspect of energy quality is becoming more and more important before it was uh, almost a pure economic business. Uh, now there are many other uh, externalities, as it is called. And uh, fusion has, of course, a number of uh, major advantages. The fuels are geographically widely available. And uh, we see nowadays, but already on other occasions, uh, going back to the oil crisis of 1974, how important this is, energy independence. And it is a, a quasi unlimited source of energy. It is uh, inherently safe and does not provide long-term radioactive waste. And this is very important uh, for the societal accept uh, acceptability. Uh, we should, of course, not repeat the mistakes that the, the fission world has made over the decades. And uh, I stress there the following sentence that radioactivity is not inherent to fusion in contrast to fission. And another point, uh, also with respect to renewable energy sources, fusion power plants provide a centralized source of baseload electricity, which can back up for fluctuations, uh, unavoidable fluctuations of renewable energy sources. So here in uh, one uh, drawing, uh, the European fusion landscape. So presently we have a number of uh, medium and small scale tokamaks, a number of linear devices. Uh, the European fusion program is coordinated by Eurofusion on behalf of uh, the European Commission. And there is also say an more and more emphasis on the development of stellarators. So presently the largest uh, Stellarator in the world is the Wendelstein 7X in uh, Greifswald. Yet the Joint European to uh, Tokamak is still the largest machine in the world, but it is uh, now approaching the end of its life, will be uh, with a um, second uh, deuterium tritium uh, experimental phase. Uh, FRE is coordinating all the activities of the European Union with respect to ITER, which is from, for the moment being built in uh, Tadarash. And uh, apart from that, there is also uh, development of uh, IFMIF, which I will deal with at the end of the lecture. And there is a so-called satellite uh, ITER Tokamak uh, built in Japan which is called JT60SA, and which has to play an important role uh, on the way from ITER to DEMO. So this is uh, not with all the partners here, which you see all the partners of ITER, but it is a so-called broader approach agreement between the EU and Japan. Eurofusion has a roadmap for uh, electricity from uh, fuel, uh, for, from fusion energy, 2050 and beyond. And uh, so the aim now, the first aim is ITER, but uh, DEMO is already intensively being prepared. So we have a so-called stage approach. So ITER, DEMO, fusion power plant, and in addition, IFMIF, which by the way, many people consider as important as uh, ITER for the future of um, fusion as an energy source. And the two main reasons for the fact that we have this stage approach is that there is insufficient knowledge of the behavior of a burning plasma, meaning dominated by alpha particle heating compared to present day uh, devices. And secondly, uncertainties in fusion reactor uh, technology. 
So uh, making fusion energy a reality depends crucially on the success of ITER. So ITER is a Latin word for the way, uh, currently under construction in the south of France. ITER is a large scale scientific experiment intended to prove the viability of fusion as an energy source. So it is a really unprecedented international effort with seven partners who have pooled their financial and scientific resources to build the biggest fusion reactor in history. So it is one of the most ambitious scientific collaborations of uh, all times. So when finished, ITER will be the first fusion device to produce net energy and it will allow to demonstrate the scientific and technological base for large scale fusion energy. It will lead the way to the subsequent implementation of the demo fusion reactors, more than one, followed by commercial uh, fusion uh, power plants. So here you have a picture, not the most recent one, it is from May of this year uh, of the ITER side and the first Plasma uh, is uh, scheduled for the end of uh, 2025. So now uh, some words about uh, fusion education. The continued education of scientists and engineers in fusion science and technology is essential to the success of ITER and DEMO and to the realization of fusion as a clean and sustainable energy source. We need more experts and also significant expansion of the competences of the workforce and the number of job opportunities and career and the career pr uh, prospects are uh, increasing. The education and training of experts uh, takes typically 10 years and it thus requires a focused human resource strategy and a well-structured education. So education and training became, not so long ago, but it became an integral component of the common European fusion program. And several successful international initiatives have been developed in the area of masters and PhD programs. As uh, most of you probably know, uh, Fusion EP, so the European Master of Science in Nuclear Fusion and Engineering Physics, has played and is still playing a uh, pioneering role in uh, fusion education. So it started already 15 years ago, 2006. And uh, we had over 200 uh, graduates over these years and so this program is still going on the coordination is now taken over by university of uh, marseille together with uh, ca Calaraj, uh, taken over from kent university uh, who started with this program uh, together with partners from france spain uh, and initially also from Sweden and uh, also from Germany. So <laughs> the need for an integrated and international fusion education program is further motivated by the increasingly important role of industry in fusion. So in the coming decades, the fusion R&D program will gradually shift from being a science-driven and laboratory-based to technology-driven, industry-based undertaking. And for this reason, for instance, also the program of uh, Fusion EP, the Master Fusion EP, has been adapted, is gradually being adapted to stay in line with this uh, shift. So ITER will make, will test or validate most technological solutions for DEMO and significant innovation is required in areas such as breathing blanket, remote maintenance, diverter, uh, tritium and uh, materials. 
Another very important point is the so-called nuclearization of fusion. So the transition will focus on technologies and standards associated with the nuclearization of fusion. And this has consequences, of course, for the required uh, competences of the workforce. And since uh, at least five years, there are coordinated actions, coordinated between the fission and the fusion uh, community. We should, of course, take advantage of the long, the decades long experience of uh, the fission community, also in the field of education. Fusion research. Uh, further shows an increasing and very important spin-off in many fields of science and engineering, new materials, superconducting coils, robotics, uh, infrared thermography, high power, uh, radio frequency sources, space propulsion, and so on. And this, uh, by the way, is very important vis-a-vis -vis the public, because the public sees that, uh, sees the price of ether, of course, it's a very high price. And everything is from uh, tax money, if you can say. So it is also important to demonstrate that uh, there is a lot of spin-off due to the advanced fusion research. Content of the textbook. So it, it has been released uh, during the last fusion energy conference in May of this year, and the printed version uh, will be available in the beginning of 2022. A precise date is not yet known, so it is now being uh, edited um, by the publishing section of IAEA in Vienna. So this was an initiative years ago in the framework of FuseNet, the EU Fusion Education Network, and there is uh, already a preliminary online version, uh, which is available already from May 2021. So it is not the final version, but it can already be used by uh, students uh, and by uh, teachers. So the realization of fusion energy requires close interaction between plasma and fusion physicists materials research, plasma wall interaction, and fusion technologies. So as you know, there are a number, uh, rather large number of excellent textbooks on fusion physics. For example, the IAEA textbook edited on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of fusion research, which is now already 10 years ago, almost. But there are very few uh, I would say almost no up-to-date textbooks on fusion technology. And so given the fast evolution which I depicted in the broad field of fusion technology in view of ITER demo and fusion power plants, the fusion education community uh, decided that we really need a textbook on fusion technology that is suitable as lecture material, so not a compilation of review articles. Uh, not, uh, it's not, not a scientific work. It is really a textbook meant for education. So the introductory chapter um, deals with the prospect of fusion as an energy source, with the characteristics of magnetic fusion reactors. So what I mentioned already in the beginning, the so-called energy quality criteria, which become more and more important, safety, environment. And <clears throat> these uh, criteria become more and more important. And it is only when these criteria can be fulfilled by uh, fusion that uh, the future of fusion as an energy source will depend on the economic aspects. Of course, presently, uh, to give uh, cost of electricity of kilowatt hour from fusion is a bit too far reaching. It, uh, it will still take several decades. And what will happen in these decades, prices of other uh, uh, fuels uh, development of uh, re 
uh, renewable energy sources, batteries and so on. So there are a number of uh, uh, question marks and so this can presently not be answered. So the emphasis of this textbook is on Pokamax because they are the most advanced, but there is also a chapter on the stellarators. And so at the end of this uh, chapter, <clears throat> the different uh, chapters are uh, introduced. Uh, the second part is on uh, heating and current drive. So in fusion power plants, neutral beam injection and ion cycle from range of frequency are the primary candidates for heating and current drive, while electron cyclotron heating uh, might be considered for current profile control if necessary. The emphasis is on the efficiency of the power sources and the transmission line lines and on the coupling efficiency to the plasma. Neutral beam energy should be large enough to achieve a high current drive efficiency and penetrate deep into the higher density plasma uh, in a machine like ETER. And this has motivated the development of one to two megavolt, uh, mega uh, electrovolt neutral beam systems. In ICRF, um, the wave launching system is of course an issue uh, inside the vessel. Uh, the antennas on, on the waveguides, depending on, on the frequency range. So this might be a concern in the strong uh, irradiation environment. Non-inductive current drive is indispensable for the steady state operation of a commercial uh, Pokemon reactor. So if the current, total current is driven by non-inductive methods, the current drive power is estimated to become a few hundreds of megawatts and this is, of course, not acceptable for an electric power generating plant. But fortunately, the radial transport in a toroidal device induces a toroidal current, the so-called bootstrap current, and a large fraction of the plasma current, 50-80%, should be driven by this bootstrap current. The chapter on diagnostics uh, for proper operation of the tokamak, the active and simultaneous control of many plasma parameters is needed. So this implies that new, robust, and fail-safe, uh, I stress these two words, technique should be developed. So roughly speaking, it can be stated that progress in plasma diagnostics is dictated by the desire to understand the detailed physical processes occurring in the plasma, as well as by the wish, necessity, I would say, to actively control many important plasma parameters. So an additional driver for diagnostic innovation comes from the requirement for better machine protection systems, and this is being treated in chapter four. So demo diagnostics and associated control systems are constrained by the extreme environmental conditions inside the reactor, mostly due to the high uh, neutron flux and fluence and the stringent requirements of reliability, availability, and maintainability. So plasma operation in demo will be even more robust than on ITER since, for instance, pulse land will be longer and disruptions have to be absolutely avoided. Magnetic coils, so till the beginning of the 1980s, all fusion magnet systems were resistive. So this was possible due to the small size of the devices operating in pulses. The largest machine of this type is JET, and the required power to energize JET is more than one gigawatt and can only be produced by flywheel generation generators, and this is a solution which is possible due to the short duration of jet discharges, 10 to 30 seconds. So ITER will still be a pulsed machine, but the electrical power necessary to energize the whole system uh, with resistive magnets would be 2 gigawatt during 500 seconds, and this can 
reasonably not be obtained from the electrical grid. So the high level of this electrical power in the case of resistive magnets and the perspective for future steady state machines have driven the plasma physics community to develop superconducting magnet systems in their uh, experimental devices. The production of the magnetic field with superconducting magnets in a large vacuum chamber like that of ITER is one of the main technological challenges and also represents a good share of the cost of such a machine. So in the future, high temperature superconductors would offer the opportunity for higher magnetic fields at higher operating temperature and margins and widen the parameter space for design and operation scenarios. And this would in turn lead to a higher overall efficiency of the power plant due to the higher fusion power density and lower uh, cryogenic power requirements. <laughs> so plasma facing components uh, is a, a very important topic. Fusion power is captured and produced in an uh, integrated first wall and blanket system that surrounds the plasma. This system will operate at high temperature to efficiently convert fusion power into electricity. Furthermore, tritium fuel will be bred by capturing fusion neutrons in a lithium containing material. And in addition, breathing blankets should also uh, shield various components, for instance, the superconducting magnets, uh, heat transport loops, cooling chemistry uh, control, and so on. So the breathing blanket uh, is a critical component for a fusion reactor. So breathing blankets demonstrate, in fact, the triple role of neutrons, at least in the, in the present configuration or the present scenario with the deuterium tritium. The blanket absorbs the 14 MeV neutrons, transforming that energy to provide most of the reactor power output, shields the superconducting poles and other components, and allows neutron multiplication and breathing of tritium. So breathing blanket consists of a neutron multiplier, a tritium breathing material, and these are called functional materials. Uh, they fulfill a specific function. Um, it consists of one or several coolants and of a structural material so to separate and contain the different materials. So the subject of the Chapter on fusion neutronics is concerned with the transport of 14 MeV neutrons through matter. The nuclear interactions result in the generation of secondary particles, and these secondary particles can be neutrons and photons, or charged particles that are assumed to be locally absorbed and contribute to the nuclear heating of the material. These interactions will also affect the atomic nuclei, which can be transmuted in uh, other nuclei that may be stable or radioactive. So the chemical composition of the considered materials changes during irradiation and a radioactive inventory is built up, which may represent a radiation hazard. The chapter on uh, materials uh, materials constitute a key issue on the way to fusion power reactors. Uh, I will dwell a little bit on this later. So there is a strong need for materials which can, which are resistant to irradiation and operate at the highest possible temperatures and are as low activation as possible to ease the public acceptance of fusion as a future energy source. We have, of course, I repeat, to learn also from uh, the history of uh, fission, uh, who have developed uh, 
generations of reactors all over, the, over the years. So there is a synergy uh, concerning material between what we need for fusion reactors, what is uh, mentioned here, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the development of advanced fission reactors and accelerator-driven systems. So vacuum and fueling, a fusion power plant is a very large and complex vacuum system. So ITER will become the most complex system, vacuum system in the world, given the large volume size of the experiment, the need to have double containment barriers for all tritium carrying systems and a variety of operational conditions. On the other hand, vacuum pumping is a good example of what I mentioned already uh, 10 minutes ago, uh, fusion triggered innovative spin-offs for the industry. So the fueling of a confined plasma is a central operational task, and it turns out to be much more complicated than one could think at first sight. So this comes from the fact that the steady state gas throughput of a fusion device is not primarily given by the consumption of fuel in the fusion reaction, but by the control and stability issues that ask for a significantly larger fuel throughput. throughput. Furthermore, non-fuel type gases uh, have also to be injected, uh, so for instance, for uh, radiative uh, cooling. The solutions uh, being developed for ITER are not necessarily a good choice for a simple scale up to power reactor so that additional uh, efforts are needed. Tritium is a radioactive species with a rather large mobility and one of the sources of hazards in fusion reactors. Given the importance of tritium, in DT reactors, detailed description of the properties, consequences, the concepts of a close tritium cycle, tritium handling rules, tritium analytics are given in chapter 10. So tritium is important enough to devote a whole chapter to it. Robotics, uh, remote handling is also becoming a very important development of a remote maintenance system for demo is driven by the need to maximize the overall plant availability. And this overall plant availability is the strongest downward driver of cost of energy in a fusion power plant and therefore has to be minimized. So delivering a reactor relevant maintenance concept will drive the design towards a lower number of replaceable maintenance modules and the elimination of complex in vessel operations. So, the in vessel environmental conditions in demo uh, radiation activation, decay, uh, heating, and so on will be far more aggressive than those in ether. This will restrict the type of maintenance that can be performed in vessel and the type of equipment that can be uh, deployed. So this chapter 11 uh, deals with the elements and design principles of a remote maintenance system <clears throat> for a fusion power plant. So the book is uh, focused on Tokamax, but there is the last chapter is devoted to stellarators, uh, a little bit the physics and the several major uh, experimental findings, and uh, the question how the magnetic field topology can be optimized to improve desired plasma uh, properties. So technological aspects which are proper to stellarators are discussed, focusing on the tailoring of the magnetic field topology. On the other hand, stellarators can overcome potential difficulties in the tokamak line of development and vice versa. And therefore, and that's also what the European Union does, 
the lateral development of both magnetic confinement fusion lines is an important overall risk mitigation matter. So uh, briefly, some critical issues for materials as an example. So this is, uh, this goes back to 1946 to the famous Enrico Fermi in Chicago, the first uh, experimental fission reactor. So Fermi stated already in 1946 that the success of nuclear technology will depend critically on the behavior of materials in the intense radiation field of reactors. And there I want to stress the contrast between fission and fusion. So already at the end of the 1950s, beginning of the 1960s, there were a dozen experimental fission reactors where the effect of radiation on materials could be investigated. And now after 60 years of fusion research, we still don't have the dedicated uh, source uh, to make this study. So this issue is not so important for ITER, but for DEMO, it is uh, quite important, uh, certainly for fusion uh, power reactors. So this is another uh, demonstration of what I called the nuclearization of fusion. Uh, in DT fusion, we have neutrons, we have alpha particles. So the plasma facing components and the blanket will be exposed to plasma particles, electromagnetic radiation, but also to 14 MeV neutrons. And this 14 MeV is much higher than what occurs in a fission reactor. So it means that there will be other types of reactors such as the production of helium. Uh, helium is a new um, a noble gas and it doesn't interact with uh, materials so it can form bubbles and uh, this can be a serious problem for the lifetime of the materials. So how to account for the actual irradiation condition um, fusion relevant spectrum temperatures accumulated damage and so on. So for the moment, most effort is on modeling of radiation damage. And now the preparation of a materials, a few international fusion materials ir irradiation facility called IFMIF. The main irradiated components are the blanket, the diverter and the first wall. So there are Broadly speaking, three types of irradiated materials, the plasma facing materials serving as an armor for other materials, the so-called functional materials and the structural materials constituting the basic structure of the fusion reactor. If MIF uh, is being developed in the frame of the so-called broader approach agreement between the EU and Japan, uh, which uh, contains activities to complement the ETA project and to accelerate the realization of fusion energy through R&D and advanced technologies for future uh, fusion power reactor demos. Because IFMIF, uh, for many reasons, uh, takes a very long time, uh, the mission of, of uh, IFMIF is really to have 14 MeV source and at high intensity for the qualification of candidates material, for calibration and validation of data, which nowadays are generated from fission reactors and particle accelerators, and to identify possible new phenomena. But to accelerate this, because of the importance for demo, and not to uh, again slow down the development of fusion, we try to bridge the gap to IFMIF by um, devices with somewhat downscaled um, specifications. So one hour accelerator, for instance, is instead of two, and there are several uh, proposals. Uh, one of them is DONES, the demo-oriented neutral source, which will be built in uh, Granada in uh, Spain. 
So an, a lot of development, which as a Belgian I, I have to mention, is the project Mira, which is at the Belgian uh, Nuclear Research Center in Mol. So here is a computer drawing. So this will be um, a device based on the ADS accelerator driven system. So it is a fish, it will be a fission reactor, but not driven by um, neutron chain reactions, but by externally by uh, 600 MeV uh, accelerators. So the whole project here, what you see, this is about 500 meters long. So the first phase, and I mentioned this because of the fusion education aspects, will be um, a reactor of one, 100 MeV, um, 100 MeV a proton accelerator. Uh, this project is called Minerva, and it will produce protons, but via a spallation reaction, also neutrons. So it can contribute uh, to basic physics, to med medical isotopes, but also to fusion materials, and already from the year 20. 26. So a uh, fusion user community has been created for Minerva uh, at the end of, of this of the present year, and it will be uh, operational from next year on. Now, conclusions. So the main objective of this textbook is to contribute to the consolidation and better exploitation of the achievements already reached and to tackle the present challenges in preparing the workforce in different areas with special attention to continuous professional development and lifelong learning. And here is the last slide. The book covers a wide range of topics as to have noticed and is primarily meant for master students and PhD students. But it will also be useful for specialists from academia, research institutions, companies who want to acquire knowledge of other areas in magnetic fusion technology, as well as for a wider range of interested readers interested in the establishment of fusion, magnetic fusion as an energy source. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Guido, for your very interesting talk, covering a very wide uh, range of, of different subjects involving nuclear fission. Uh, so now is uh, time for, for questions. I will start by asking maybe a long and a bit controversial question myself, but since we have the 2050 horizon in in Europe and uh, fusion energy as an energy source will take um, more time than the 2050 horizon to become a reality. Uh, why? What are the reasons why you will encourage uh, master students and maybe PhD students to continue their career in fusion and not jump to other maybe more critical issues than energy storage and other ways of research? Uh, well, this is, uh, of course, a question not, <laughs> not so easy <laughs> to answer. Um, but uh, I, I, I would say the following. So fusion energy for, for different reasons, mainly political ones, yeah. uh, is still not ready. It could have been ready if everything uh, continued as it should be, if politicians uh, in different parts of the world had taken the right decisions. But of course, this applies not only to fusion, it applies to uh, many other areas of, of science, of economy, of medicine, and so on. Yeah. So uh, the main question is now, of course, um, what ma many people ask also, will, will fusion not come too late? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what is too late? 
fact, if we are now very um, negative, we could say uh, uh, climate change is unavoidable, temperature will rise, that's wrong. Uh, so let's simply wait what will happen. But, but this is a solution. I think the only solution to try to mitigate the effects is to make new developments and also technological developments. And uh, now I will say something that is maybe a bit uh, controversial. Um, so I mentioned uh, Enrico Fermi. This was 1946, the first yeah. fission reactor. And also not so long after we had the first electricity product, uh, producing reactor. But if, again, if the right decisions would have been taken, if uh, better uh, reactors would have developed, if there was not so much opposition in society from green side, from other sides, mm -hmm. would have been much further and we would have avoided a lot of CO2, which is now causing this climate change. So I would say, in a way, we can even blame these people that they have hindered the development of uh, fission. We could have been much further. And I'm convinced that we have to work, we, we have to develop more and more technologies which can help. Uh, in mitigating the effects and uh, nuclear energy is certainly one of them. So I think we will absolutely need fission, fission reactors to bridge the gap. I would say bridge the gap to fusion. But that doesn't mean that fusion has not, not to be further developed. So because as you all know, if fusion can be developed and can keep the promises, it is still the ideal energy source for the future. So I would say I, I work, as you said in the beginning, 50 years uh, in this field. Yeah. Uh, I've also been thinking, Sir Moyal, will, uh, will I ever see any result? And, and one of the reasons that uh, around the year 2000, I went from research to education was exactly because I realized that I will probably never see the first uh, working or electricity producing fusion power reactor in my life. Then I said, yeah, I have now tried to uh, transfer my knowledge uh, to, to younger people who can continue uh, with this uh, very important task. So, I would say people who think about the future of uh, mankind uh, have a very nice opportunity in development of fusion of energy sources in general, but in particular, I would say in fusion, but also in fission. So I really see no good reason now uh, that young people would not go into this direction. Of course, uh, there are uncertainties and so on, but uh, I think in, in life you, you are never sure. No? Yeah. So you have always to take a certain calculated risk, I would say. But uh, fusion, also from scientific point of view, is of course very uh, challenging, very attractive. But now it is much more than this. <clears throat> now it is really the road to uh, electricity from fusion. And if you can contribute to this, I think your uh, contribution will be very valuable for uh, mankind. Yes. I don't know if I answered your question. But... Yes, yes. Of course, of course. <laughs> this is a very long topic of discussion and I just wanted to bring the topic yeah I um, I have recently started my PhD in fusion but I can help myself from thinking about this that uh, fusion uh, Europe 
is pushing everything to be carbon neutral in in 2050 and yeah i think fusion is very challenging and has a lot of potential to be the energy source of the future but but yeah i cannot stop thinking like there is a big problem because also being carbon neutral for 2050 is a huge challenge and i'm thinking well i'm looking to other side and just hoping that uh that the rest of the people uh, work <laughs> <laughs> uh, and succeed to make this challenge and we can stop the temperature to rise more than 100 and, and 1.5 degrees and, and yeah and also uh, there are uh, oh, well now it's uh, starting the the companies and also the private sector to be to be working in new new ways maybe more focused on the industrial uh, part of a fusion reactor and i also wanted to ask you about this about the modular uh, reactors that the united states are aiming uh, for and also some companies here in europe that are saying like fusion could be a reality in in 10 years i see this this is good as a way to uh, be optimistic and to keep the students motivated to join the the fusion research but do you think it is realistic that this could be done or <laughs> what is your opinion on this uh, well at least in europe so the main line, the roadmap is 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 ETAM, eh? yeah. but uh, I would say that all other activities, which are now mainly uh, Canada, uh, USA, uh, also somehow in the UK, yeah. can be useful. So, so I think that every contribution sure. yeah. can be useful because you. And this is the basic thing of a research. You, you never know what, what, what will be the outcome. Eh? Yeah. So it could be even useful in the development of some specific technologies, which, uh, as I explained, are uh, quite important. And uh, it will, in fact, also offer opportunities to, to young people, because yeah. uh, if you have to focus everything on, on one or on a few machines it also reduces the, the opportunities for, uh, for new people eh? mm -hmm. so i think that all these uh, activities are welcome and uh, i think that most of them are from private funds yeah so i would say if these very rich people want to spend some of their wealth to this uh, it's a good sign. <laughs> you have to welcome it without even having too much hope that uh, something will come out. But uh, I, I think it is it is worth uh, trying if they want to mm -hmm. some, some budget to this. Eh? Yes. But uh, uh, Daniel, another point, uh, I, I would say maybe a bit different between positive and negative thinking. If you are uh, given my age, I always go back to, to the past, also historical things and so on. Yeah. As you probably know, it is now 50 years ago that the so-called Club of Rome published a very negative report about the future of the planet. Yeah. And uh, this was uh, really, re if, you, if you read it again, it is really very bad. But uh, you have to say that all their forecast, all what they predicted, didn't come out because of, I would say, uh, human intelligence. So uh, people try to find, if there are particular problems, they try to find solutions. Yeah. So I think about what Club of Rome said to uh, decrease the growth because it's not sustainable. If this would have happened, we would be, I think, in a much worse condition than now. So it is, you need growth 
to, for instance, to finance research. So yeah. If everything is going down, also research will no longer be funded. So uh, I think we have no no other choice than to go forward and, and try to develop uh, new technology to mit mitigate the effects as much. We are not in 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 a, in a very favorable condition. This is true, of course. But it doesn't mean that uh, you have to be. Uh, too negative and, and just wait until the whole planet will disappear. No? So uh, maybe it's a bit uh, a bit too strong what I'm saying now, but the yeah, is, uh, that I agree, yeah. <laughs> you, you you have to you have to be positive, look at the future, and uh, try to try to find uh, solutions. You know? Yes. And furthermore. So now we are, of course, focusing on uh, ITER, but in different parts of the world, uh, people are already preparing uh, the step beyond demo. Yeah. There will be, like the situation is now, there will be different demos, and if there are different machines in different parts of the world, so I'm sure that the progress will be faster. And that there will be also more opportunities for people to, to contribute to, to this. Yes. Um, since I don't see, because I don't want to <laughs> be taking all the questions, but since I, since I don't see uh, hands raised, I will ask you another question. Do you think... Oh, now we have a question from... Uh, Mikola, Mikola. Mikola it's, uh... Yes. I will allow you to unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, Professor uh, Guido. Hello, Mikola. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, I have, I, I'm very happy to see this book, and thank you very much for presenting it. Uh, I have a, a kind of uh, maybe a suggestion or also in question, maybe you can comment on this. It's like in Europe, we don't uh, talk a lot about uh, the fusion experiments in the United States. And I had a huge surprise when I arrived to the United States and I was introduced to the whole world of actually fusion happening there with a lot of uh, fusion experiments, uh, not only uh, uh, stellarators and uh, tokamaks, but also new advanced fusion conce concepts, uh, for one of which I'm working uh, currently magnetic uh, mirror concept uh, and your approaches uh, to, to confine plasma there. So it's uh, it's very interesting. I think uh, there's something we should also talk about in Europe and maybe include uh, in the books also. Uh, I don't know if, if this topic is touched in this book. I haven't yet uh, checked it, but maybe you can comment on this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, two, two comments. So first of all, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this was an initiative of FuseNet, and FuseNet is within Eurofusion. And in Europe, we have, well, we have, we follow the, the roadmap to uh, fusion electricity. So that's why uh, <clears throat> most of the or almost F, every. Uh, focus is 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 on tokamaks, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, it doesn't mean that this book uh, will be adapted in, in in the future. And and this is an advantage and the reason why we have uh, opted for IAA as an editor, uh, because IAA is. Um, not uh, looking for for profit. So, and they can, as long as, as is possible, uh, re-edit, reprint this book. So this is not the case with uh, commercial editors, as long as there is no uh, prospect of uh, profit, they, they, they will not reprint the book. So this is not the case here. Uh, but uh, you, you mentioned mirrors and their, well, I, I've till now I think been very positive, but I, I also want to say something negative. Uh, <laughs> if I think of the fusion history in the United States, 
Uh, I don't know how long it is ago, but it's probably something like 50 years. There has been a huge mirror machine, uh, which has costed a, a lot of money. There was a very good uh, program uh, proposed, but because a, a new administration came, new president, new administration, it has been completely mothballed. And uh, as maybe most of you know, the present ITER uh, is not what was initially planned. The name is again ITER, but it is not the ITER as it was conceived in the beginning. This was bigger and would, for instance, have had a full scale uh, breathing blanket. This will not be the case. It will be modules now. So, and this was due to the decision of the United States at that time to step out of ITER. Uh, afterwards, when they saw that ITER was uh, continuing and being successful, they joined again. But I only want to say that uh, what is happening now, all these different initiatives, uh, I'm not so confident that they will live long. So in, th in that sense, there is, there is, of course, a basic difference between policy in the United States and in the European Union. European Union, we are uh, with uh, 28 boundaries of 27, no 28 at fusion. Um, and we are linked to each other. So one government cannot make a decision that will kill a, a whole uh, program that exists 50 years. Huh? So I, I, I agree that these initiatives are very positive, but I don't know how long they will be continued. You understand what I mean? Uh, Mikola? Mikola? Has Guido answered your question? Maybe I will, I have to allow you to unmute yourself again. Oh, yes, thank you. I couldn't <laughs> unmute myself. Uh, yeah, Guido, I understand uh, what you mean. Uh, I agree, it's a lot of politics in here. And with every change of administration, you can be sure that they will contribute into ITER. Uh, but it's also because ITER takes a long, long time to, to be built, uh, of course. And uh, now talking to Americans, I understand their concerns. Uh, but I should also mention that uh, Americans uh, have their their way of uh, of making fusion uh, happening faster than than ITER actually, and they are planning of this spark experiment. I don't know if you if you heard it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's something they they uh, they presented uh, recently at the APS uh, conference, and it surprised the audience a lot because basically they they aim for two uh, for the fusion game. Uh, more than 10 in uh, several years uh, already. Like yeah. if I remember it's uh, by 2025 or a bit later after that. So that's that's very interesting. They are, they are moving very fast too. They have a lot of fusion concepts. I was just thinking that it would be just maybe nice to mention because in Europe we don't, we don't talk about it, but uh, I think we still should because you know, it's global fusion world. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I just want to add that I repeat that I really welcome the, these in, initiatives uh, very much. Uh, I'm sure that if they are continued long enough, they can contribute. For instance, high temperature superconductors, high field machines, other materials. So ether is now defined and has not much flexibility. So you cannot investigate too many things in, in, in one single machine. So only this is already a good reason uh, to welcome initiatives like that. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really like uh, uh, your answer and I understand uh, the, the concerns. <laughs> thank you, Nicola, for your question. So yeah, actually my next question was going to be uh, very similar to what uh, Mikola asked, and it was about 
that when I see, for example, now I, I was thinking more about my question, and when I see uh, the Stellarator and the Tokamak uh, concept, I really see the parallel work in the same direction. But when it comes to comparing the um, private versus the maybe it should be private plus United States sector compared to the public sector in 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 Europe, I don't feel that sense of collaboration and working together anymore. I see more the competition uh, typical from the private sector when where the public machines are going for big designs to do experiments and to and to to demonstrate that the technology is viable while the private sector is just taking the knowledge from the public uh, sector and try to develop things quickly and maybe talking about the star uh, spark sorry uh, I always have the same concern if they have such a, a small and modular machine how will they deal with the huge huge uh, heat loads I don't know if uh, you have an opinion or an impression about this but somehow I always have the same feeling that the private sector is not being really realistic when it comes to the deadlines and the technology the, the heat load is in that indeed uh, the main concern and I I'm, I'm absolutely not sure that they can solve this problem no? yeah but uh, you can also ask why are private people or companies investing in this maybe some of them really want to contribute to say the mankind in general yeah uh, but I think that others are probably aiming at acquiring some intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Some, um, for, for instance, in the field of high temperature uh, superconductors and so yeah. Some de development <coughs> uh, turns out to be successful and they have the intellectual property. And if fusion is successful, <coughs> it will be develop to future energy stores. So this is a huge market. So I think that some of them have also these considerations. No? So let's invest part of our uh, uh, of our budget in this uh, with um, risks and so on. But there is maybe the opportunity to acquire important intellectual property. I am not sure, but I, I guess that this is maybe for one, for some of these people also a driver.